You know, um, a little while ago I started uh, a focus on ministering angels. Was, you know, if you open up um, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, in the first chapter, it talks about it. It ends up there in that first chapter with, don't you know that we all have ministering angels for those who are going to receive salvation? That's you and me, every one of us, we have the ministry of angels. But I have got to say, it was never really a thing that I was preoccupied or even thought of or even thought necessary. It's like, what, what do the angels do? And the only thing that I thought of, ministering angels, well, they were in the Old Testament there. We've had a number of those occasions. We have got them around Jesus' ministry. We've got them even in um, some of the apostle stories and what they were on about. And they, we have angels all the way through. But in my experience as a pastor in the last 30 years, the only time that we sort of had something about angels was Christmas when we asked the kids to dress up as little angels. And um, maybe we give, give it a mention at the resurrection when the two angels were there at the open tomb. But again, it was like, but you and me, ministering angels? Not actually something that I was very preoccupied with or thought about until I had my own near-death experience. You know, the heart flatlined and there's a story to it, but I don't want to go into that because this is the second part of, of this story about the angels because when everything sort of finished off and I put a pacemaker in and, and everything else, I was at home, I was praying to God with regards to everything that I've seen and rather than just giving me some understanding of this idea, well, you know, here we are, then we go there, and ta-da, that's it. And rather than saying, well, don't you know that when you die, you go to heaven? Well, as a pastor, I sort of said, yeah, I know that, right? So rather than answering my little silly questions, he decided to give me these experiences of angels. And last time I shared with everybody my first one, which was very much about God's ministering angels. I was in bed, uh, recovering after the operation was taking place, and um, it was the afternoon. Sun was going down on the window, and so it was like you know around fourish. I remember Penny's folks; they were there saying, "How are you doing?" You know, as they do when you're kind of out of an operation, and you know, it's like, "How how's things going? Good." And then I said, "Great! Now we're going to have a cup of coffee." And they went into the other room and had their chin wag while I was there in bed and continuing my thoughts, which were really preoccupying my almost every moment. Why God? What was this near-death experience all about? And then, bang, I had these five angels appear around my bed. That was that first time. That's what I said the last time, the ministering angels. But the following day, we had more visitors come and again in the afternoon because it seemed to be around that same time. Again, they were saying hi where I was pepped up in the seat. So I was awake. I wasn't dozing off. I wasn't with drugs and like, you know, drooly and like, you know, no, nothing of that. Totally awake, ready, saying hi. And they again, Penny said, let's have a cup of coffee. They went and I was there in my bed back into prayer with God, still saying, well, now this heavenly experience, now I've got these angel experiences, what the, what am I supposed to do with it? How is this going to be processed? I was, can you just imagine, even though I'm a pastor and I know this is all in God's word, to me it was like God taking me away from kindergarten and putting me on a university level and saying, you should know this. And then it was like, that experience on the second day, was with a different bunch of angels who came in. And they came in all crouched and huddled together and they were coming in into the room and they were not with the sparkle and the energy and the vibrancy of the other angels seen the previous day, but all shriveled up almost like grey parchment paper. You know that cooking paper when you kind of like that kind of greyish. And as they came in, I remember they filled the room with such dread and threat of death 
it really freaked me out. And the funny thing is, I started apologising to them. And I've got to tell you why I started apologising when they moved in is because the day before when I had the experience with these holy ministering angels, they actually gave me the gift of speaking in tongues for, for a ministry of uttering what God is giving me through instructions to them. I don't know what I'm saying. So I was just sharing you know, God's word with them or the instructions. And you can have a tune in on the last one that I did on, on that story. But then when these other ones came in, I thought I must have said something wrong. Right? So it's like, you know, that's why I was apologising to them. It's like, you know, I don't know about this speaking in tongues business, so obviously I said something that upset them. And, um, and then God started to speak into my understanding and said, this is what I want you to do with these fallen angels. And immediately I thought, okay, this is not ministering angels, these are the menacing angels. And this is what I want to talk about today is that other part of what we have to deal with in the spiritual realm, not just the God's holy angels that minister to us, but the fact is that we are in a world that is fallen, both physical and spiritual. And in that spiritual realm, we have these menacing or fallen angels that keep harassing and bothering us and doing all sorts of mischief and God is actually saying, I want you to deal with them. This is how I want you to deal with them. Before I get to that, what I want to say right at the beginning here is that I believe that God is restoring something very important to the church. I believe that God is restoring all the things that he gave to the church when he began the church with Pentecost and the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? God is actually restoring all the things that he gave through the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He's giving that back to the church and making sure that we take note that it is happening. And I believe actually with that, that there is going to be a huge awakening and a huge move of God because with that awakening, we are going to have... I prayed about that and sort of had that word when we were having this thing here, so I'm going to insert it because I thought that was actually quite clever. We're going to have... Sleeper cells waking up. You know, I'm a James Bourne fan and all of that kind of stuff, which means that, you know, when you're talking about sleeper cells, you're not talking about something nice. They're usually assassins. But the thing is, um, in the spiritual realm, we have a lot of Christians baptized, maybe gone to Sunday school, know about Jesus, maybe lost their way, and they've all become sleeping slumbering sleeper cells. Where are they? Where are the full churches? They've slumbered. But God hasn't forgotten them yet. And I think God is going to wake them up. And I think there's going to be a great awakening that is going to do something very important. And this is what I had in a little vision that was here. I haven't really spoken about it because I thought, yeah, okay, God, you know, you do your thing. But... The vision was, I had a spotlight that was here on the pulpit and God was shifting the spotlight and putting it onto the people. And it's a move from platform focused, pastor focused, to people focused. A move of not kind of being, okay, this is my little download for you and you kind of say, that was nice, pastor. And then you go home and do your, put your post, post, ro the roast on and have your family over and and you've already forgotten what was said, right? Usually happens by the time you have a cup of coffee. But, you know, sometimes we sort of hang on for a little bit longer. But I think what God is actually showing the church around the world in this particular year, especially, is that he's closed churches and he's sent us out. And we actually are the sent people of God. But we've forgotten that. We've even slept on that, even if you go to church. When Jesus rose from the dead and he went to his disciples and caught up with them, you can read about it in John chapter 20, what happened? He met with them and he breathed it on and said, receive the Holy Spirit as the Father has sent me, now I'm going to send you. That's why we are the sent people of God. With that being sent, it is not just, okay, just as you are. No, 
He pours his Holy Spirit in us. And that was the other thing about Pentecost that you see in the other Gospels. And with that came fire from heaven, God's holy fire on them, tongues of fire resting on them. And they started to have gifts of speaking in other tongues. And they obviously had such a great time doing it, they woke up the whole neighborhood around them. Because they came out of their houses and said, what's going on here? You can read about it in Acts. And they were so full of joy and speaking in tongues and doing their thing that they thought, man, these guys are having an early party. It's only nine o'clock in the morning and they already look like they're drunk. Wouldn't that be great to finish today when we finish this? To be so filled with joy, so filled with the Holy Spirit, so filled that the rackets that we're going to make is going to wake up the neighbours. But what I really want is this higher idea that we had in our mega time of prayer is that these sleeper cells, Christians all over Toowoomba, Christians all over Brisbane, Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast, wherever we find them where they have fallen asleep on their faith. Come on, wake up. Time to wake up. It's action time. When we are finally waking up, when we finally realize why it is that God is restoring all things, is because if this is right, that the spotlight is going to the people, it means this is going to be a people movement, and the reason for that is that what God is doing requires all hands on deck. It's no longer kind of sitting on the bench. And it's no longer no one puts baby in the corner. <laughs> it is going to be, you know, jump up and do the fly thing. Am I talking to the wrong generation? <laughs> <laughs> what would it be like if we all started to dance with God, the dance of salvation, the dance of recovering people the way that Jesus, when he ministered and he called his disciples, said, I'm going to train you to do stuff. And they started to see miracles happen. Eyes that were blind, open, lame, were walking, lepers being cleansed, all sorts of matter of things. I'm sure the disciples, when they walked with Jesus, thought, hey, this is cool. I love it. Then later on, you see actually the disciples were doing exactly the same thing. And just as with the gifts, do you know what else was happening around that time? What else was so prominent in just about everything right from the time that Jesus was baptized throughout his ministry and everything that involved then later on the disciples? What else happened? And we don't often talk about it. I've already said I'm going to talk about it. Ministry of angels and dealing with demons and being authoritative in that spiritual realm so much so that we get so used to angels that as scripture says, you may actually be entertaining people and not knowing that you're actually entertaining angels. Become so used to the fact that they are going to be ministering with you for something very important. So that's what I want to actually talk about, the surprise of God's holy angels and then this idea of that he's given us authority to deal in the spiritual realm with these menacing angels. So let me come back to that part when God spoke to me at that bed when these ministering angels came in. And he said four things. This is what I want you to do with them. The first thing he said is mute them. Can you just put your finger on your lips? Mute them. He said, shut up. Shut them up. Why? Because whatever they're going to say, they're going to lie to you. Satan is the father of lies. What do you think they're going to be doing? They're going to speak lies constantly. The first thing is, have you ever sort of, I don't know if you've been harassed by some of that evil stuff that gets into your head, and it's like, you know, what do they always say? Negative things, negative things, negative things. You're no good. You're going to die. You're going to be whatever. Do you know, when, we had, uh, when I had that first, um, when was that? 
when we were down on the Sunshine Coast. No, 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 just recently. And when we came back... I just... Anyway, I was recently down the Sunshine Coast getting ready for, for the sermon. That I think it was the first one of, on the angels. And uh, we took a back road through uh, Kenilworth and all of that kind of area, right? And it's nice and windy. That's one of those areas we've got to do on a bike. <laughs> but... Every time I was driving along, I had this voice that's saying, you're going to die. You're not going to get that corner. It's going to roll over and you're going to die in flames and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you know, everywhere I was driving and I thought, is that all you can do? Because I knew I was going to talk about angels, about the ministering angels. And guess what the demonic wants to say? You better not talk about that because you'll die. And I'm saying... <laughs> I've already died. <laughs> God brought me back, so I can tell you. So the first thing is shut them up. Because whatever they're going to say into your understanding, into your receiving, is going to be garbage and it's going to be lies. So so first thing is shut them up. The second thing that he said is bind them. So just, you know, put your put your, you know, as if you were bound so that this goes like this, and then bind them. Why? Because that limits their reach into you. And whenever the demons want to do something in your life, guess what we have in John 10.10? 10, the thief comes to kill, destroy, deceive. He wants to grab things off you. He wants to take hold of the things that God has given to you and, and hold them tight so that you can't have access to it. Have you ever noticed how prayer is actually warfare? Because every time that you pray, guess what you have to do? What do I have to do at the moment? What does Nikki have to do? What do we all have to do when we pray? Have faith? Oh, yes. Strengthen my faith, please, Lord. Butt heads with demons. Well, in our part, we call it waiting. We have to wait on the answer. And it's like, and then God makes us wait more. Does God make us war? Does God make us wait? I think, I don't know, because I've been wrestling with this waiting at the moment. Because we had words of promise, we had spoken out in faith, we had lots of wonderful things that gave us a lot of hope, and then God gives us this waiting. And do you know the funny thing is that I think just like what happened with Daniel, God actually said yes straight away. God gives the answer of that blessing straight away in a level of what you were needing, the level of what you prayed for, and probably even greater. God's actually already said yes. We have that in God's word, that in Jesus, well, rather in you know, the Old Testament, I think it comes from, that in God we have his yes and amen. So the thing is, God has already said yes, it's yours. I already know that those prayers have been answered. But here's the thing. God has made you and me, and we have this again from Scripture, and this is kind of like trying to figure out how and why this important spiritual aspect is so relevant for us. God has made us to be priests, holy priests. And the priest has one foot in the natural, outside the courts of the temple, and the other foot he has in the temple, bringing the concerns of the people to God and bringing God's answer back to the people. We, as Christians, as people of God, have two feet in two realms. We have it in our physical realm where we are and the other one in our spiritual realm where God is. And so we, in prayer, bridge the gap between those two. God has given us the answer and we are holding that answer and bringing it into the manifestation, into our experience here and now. And guess who gets in the way? So what we have in Scripture is our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers, you know, against that spiritual stuff. So that we know then what he said is, first of all, shut them up so that they cannot speak no, you're not going to get your answer. 
and then bind them so that they get their hands, their filthy hands off the answer and so that the pathway between what God has said and what you need becomes, as we just sang before, he will move every mountain. He will make a straight road for the answer to be given. And the third one here that he said is then, and I thought this was clever because I would never have thought of it. That's why I know it wasn't me. He said, forbid them to be replaced. Because you see, it's like, you know, in that spiritual realm, if you knock one of those menacing angels off, guess what? The Bible says about a person who's been cleansed, and seven more are waiting, and they're ready to jump in. So the third thing, so the first thing was sh- shut them up, bind them. No, no, no. You're not going to get in there. So the waggling of the finger, no more replacement. When Jesus sets you free, you are free indeed. You're not free for a moment until the next one takes over. You are free indeed. And then the fourth one, and this is when I had this download from God. I was just about to jump in and I sort of said, oh, wow, now the fourth one, what, send them to hell? And he said, no, don't send them to hell. Send them to Christ for judgment. And here's the interesting thing is that our role in the world that God has created for us This is our domain. In Scripture, it says that those fallen angels left their domain and came and messed with us. What is our role? Our role is to get our domain back and kick them out. So that every time that you come across one of these ministering angels and you have to do battle with them, when you shut them up, when you bind them up, when you say no more replacement, uh uh-uh, you then send them to Christ for judgment because he has won the victory and he has taken them all captive and he's going to take them one by one out of the equation until finally all is well with our soul. The thing is that, you know, that sadly, so I think about it, is still some of our work. Thanks be to God that he's actually given us this ability to be confident that when we speak it out, that this will happen. This is not a maybe. This is not a wish list. God is saying to us, you can be confident. That's why I have given you the Holy Spirit and these gifts and these ministering angels so that you can go and clean up the place, clean people's lives up, make them whole again, be part of the ministry of what I did when I came here, taught the disciples to do, now I'm enlisting all of you to do likewise. It, that it should not surprise us if God, through Christ, has started that, that he's going to continue to do that, and he's calling you and me into that ministry. So, why is it all so important? Rather, before I get to that, I really feel that maybe at the moment... I should just stop and do a little bit of ministry in case one of you is actually still or some of you is still dealing with anything of that rotten rubbish that is in your life. So in Jesus' holy name, Lord, I come into your holy presence, the throne of God, where you have declared the victory, where you have given us that victory through Christ our Lord, who has said, all authority has been given to me. So we know that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord in heaven and here on earth and below. Lord, you are Lord of all. And in Jesus' name, I come against all the schemes of the evil one now. And for every one of us listening, either here online or here in this room, Lord, I thank you for your ministering angels that you've given to us. I call upon them to draw their swords and be ready to fight and to free us from all the menacing stuff that's in our life, whether it be from the past or even in the present, whether they're words of curses that have been given against us by others. Lord, first and foremost in Jesus' name, may they be muted, shut up, their voices stilled right now. May there be peace in our hearing, peace 
and the love of God, only that, no more of their menacing words. Secondly, I bind them. I bind their reach into our lives and what God has given to us, all of our possessions, our families, our loved ones, our friends, no more reach of the evil one into our life and all that is ours. Get those grubby hands off. And next Sunday, I'm going to, uh, next uh, following message, I'm going to be talking about the restoration role that the angels have. But at the moment, Lord, bind them. And then the next thing, Lord, because you have given us this word that we have in Scripture, we also declare this to be finished. No more replacement of the evil ones one after the other, but what you do is a finished job. It is done and it's dusted and there's no one from the evil one that can have access to what is now cleansed and is yours. Lord, we make it holy and declare it to be so in Jesus' holy name. And for everybody else now, Lord, I ask you that you would all join with me now that all of this evil, menacing stuff that's been in our life, we send it to Christ for judgment and it's for us hands off and we step back and Lord Jesus, you take over and you get rid of it that garbage that's no longer there, Lord, let it all burn up, let it be gone from our life, that we may stand clean and whole and holy before you, right now, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 So let me give back to why is this so important. It is so important because here's something when I started by saying that God is restoring the ministry, what I'm really saying is that this has been going on for a while. And we have been seeing it happen. But have we participated in it? Have we actually started to recognize that it is for a time such as this that all of this restoration of what God is doing is actually happening? I'm talking about the fivefold ministry that we often hear about. Now, the fivefold ministry is an interesting thing in Ephesians that is actually said for the purpose of the saints' ministry. That's you and me. So, in actual fact, all of this is given so that the saints may be built up and the church through us and our ministry will be built up. There's a really important point to this all. And here's the thing. I started to see that, but I didn't know what was happening when I was very young, still back in Germany. And uh, so I must have been about six before we left because I still have that memory of coming into a huge stadium. And it's like, as a kid, a six-year-old, my memory was, who's actually been to a football game? Anyway, do you remember when you come up the stairs and then you, you come outside and you start to see the stadium all in front of you, that moment? That's what I still have. As You're coming out and you have a stadium filled with people, but it wasn't a football game. We were then taking our seat and down at the bottom was a podium and I was singing songs and then this guy came up to speak. I was six. I had no idea what on earth was going on. It just was one of those moments that still I remember about this huge stadium as a six-year-old that was kind of like my first experience of a stadium. Surprisingly, not a football game, but according to my grandfather, when I asked, what was this all about? It was a Billy Graham crusade. So my first experience of a stadium was religious. <laughs> and that was a time after the 1950s, the post-war, when they were rebuilding everything and there was a lot of repentance going on about what had happened. You can imagine the people who survived the war and what have we done? What has war done? Their hearts were breaking everywhere they looked. There was damage and rubble. And what war has done was, was huge scars on people everywhere. No one was exempt from it. And then in the 1960s, and I'm a child of the 60s. Evangelism came. And with people like Billy Graham, it went all over the world. And it just took off everywhere. 
Stadiums were being filled and evangelism was being restored. That's one of the fivefold ministries. And then, in after the, uh, those um, 60s, pastors were getting excited and saying, hey, we could have churches like that. And so you had the beginning of mega churches. And they had big auditoriums. And they had big bands. And they had amazing things happening. Disco balls and strobe lights and everything else was going on. But the thing is, it was kind of like, you know, wow. And then they had things like ministries of tape ministries that were going out. Does anyone still remember those little tapes? And then VHS. Do you know what a VHS is? <laughs> and they went out. And so the interesting thing is that you started to have ministries that went out to the world from these churches, mega churches, with these mega guys who became famous like Jack Hayford and many others. And the corner deli, as I call it, those little village churches with old-style religion, they just could not cope with a big supermarket of church experiences that were then there. And you started to see more and more of the little village churches closing down and the big mega churches bringing in the crowds. So what God was actually doing was another one of those things, not only evangelism, but now he was starting to restore how important it was that God was bringing all of his people together that led into another phase that I remember when... <laughs> I went into the seminary in the 1980s. A little bit ahead of Edgar, I prepared the way for him. <laughs> and when, when we were there in the 1980s, the amazing things started to happen that we started to get information about this movement that was happening called apostolic movement and prophetic movements were happening with people that, you know, I still have some books about it, Rick Joyner and Peter Wagner and all sorts of things. They were, again, a huge threat to the little old village church mentality because they were talking about a restoration that is coming to the church. They were prophesying a restoration to the church. And then in the 1980s, when I was still at seminary and, and then I was doing vicarage, vicarage means that you're doing a year in the, in the field, in the Barossa Valley, that was, for me. And then people came up to me, and it was like, you know, this whole fivefold ministry is strange, and, you know, they didn't know anything about it. And I've got to admit, I didn't know much about it, because I was trained into that old-time religion model. And that meant, when you talked about what was my role and what was the role of people... The role of people was to show up if they wanted to and to be consumers of the things that are provided, to sometimes be critics of the things that are provided or to be clients of the things. But it, in many ways, we kind of like, you know, just had this consumer orientation about church. And so it became part of church hopping. You know, I like what they're doing. They've got a jumping castle. Where's your jumping castle? You haven't got a jumping castle? I'm going to go off to them because they've got a jumping castle. Strobe lights. You haven't got strobe lights and disco balls? I'm going over there. And so we started to see a mixing of all sorts of going from one place to another because we became consumers. Whether it was for the fantastic or whether it was on the low down and in the small little churches, we didn't have consumers. We had critics. No, you can't do that. We've never done that before here. No way are you going to do that here. I had one of my first churches, for goodness sake, some of the stories that you would think, it's like, are, are you for real? Has this happened? I nearly had World War III in the, one of my first churches because I dared to shift the pews on a little angle <laughs> like that so that people could actually be a little bit more in the round, right? So like, rather than just watching everyone's back and being in, like, you know, bench by bench by bench, I thought, let's make it a bit like, like this. Well, <laughs> they nearly gathered the wood and had the stake ready to burn me because I dared to shift the pews 
that the Ladies' Guild then told me that floor was polished in the 1950s and we don't move it since then. <laughs> I'm for real. You know, and you look at this and you think, oh, my goodness me, what have we invested in? What has come of the church? No wonder God is restoring it, but he's restoring it with new wine and new wineskins and the old ones just could not handle it. So he had to go with the new. And that's why I'm saying what God is going to be doing here is going to be a new thing. And we better get used to the fact that God is going to stretch us and get us out there to do something new. But then what happened was, in that period of time too, in the 1980s, people came up to me, not just talking about how does ministry happen, but then it was also a big rage of the rapture is going to happen. And people came up to me and said, have you heard about that? Do you know anything about it? And I said, I know nothing. The seminary hasn't taught me zip on any of this. So I was given a book by one of the members who said, what do you know about this? And it was a book by Edgar. <laughs> it was a book by Edgar. And it was called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. Oh, that's Edgar C. Wisenut. Oh, that's a different guy. <laughs> Edgar dared me before to say, you know, I'm going to trip you up, I'm going to have some fun. Well, I'm actually sort of ahead of you, aren't I? <laughs> but it's like, you know, I was out of my depth. God was doing so many things and he was teasing us and stretching us and making us think about so many things that, you know, if Christ is coming back, do you think he wants to have his church ready? For sure. If he's getting his church ready, how is he going to do it? Is he going to do it in the same way that he did it when he was walking among the disciples? You betcha. So what did he do then? He's going to be doing now. And that is why the ministry of angels is going to be so important. Because you see then, when we start to realize this part in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, if you want to uh, go and have a look at it um, at home, Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, but in verse 12 it says, to equip the people for works of service so that the whole body of Christ may be built up. How are we going to do this? What does this mean? Why, again, I keep on coming so that we nail this down. Why is it so important? Why is the ministry of angels so important as we have it in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, what I spoke about last time? A few things. Number one, why is this so important? The number one cause of all of this and the reason for it is because of Satan's fall. Why I start there is because in Satan's fall, we have the words in Isaiah 14, verses 13 to 14, where it shares with us his agenda. And it talked about that pride ambition was in his heart. And he said, I'm going to take the throne of God. I'm going to go and be God. And that is the agenda that we still have to battle with because he is speaking that into the world wherever he goes. And he is speaking that into people's lives. You don't need God. You can be a God yourself. And how did he do it with Adam and Eve? Did God really say are you sure God said that? Oh, why don't you just ignore that and do your own thing? Look what happened. How did that go? Brilliantly. So, why do we need the ministry of angels, God's holy angels? Is because we have these ministering angels all around us and that started with the fall of Satan and that agenda of taking God's throne, God's place, is still their agenda. And if God is not in your heart and enthroned in your heart, there is something that has been whispering in your life that says, oh, but put something else there. That goes all the way back then. And then in Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, by the way, if you go on to the chat, the morning chat for Saturday, I've got all of these listed on, on our study intro, so have a look at that. So the second thing, our fight is against these fallen powers. Isaiah 9 Revelation 12, and you know the one in Ephesians 3 and 6, where it does talk about our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against these powers and principalities. So that is actually our world. That's what we've got right now. 
until God restores everything, that's the stuff that we've got to deal with. And we have got to be prepared. And if we're going to have the spotlight going out there, you better get prepared. You better get ready for what's going to be in your face because they're not going to like it. Third point. In Hebrews 12, verse 26 to 29, we read something really important. And it's actually talked about variously in different parts of the Bible too. But we are going to be part of a great shaking, so much so that everything that is going to be shaken can be shaken. And it says there in Hebrews 12, so that what remains is the kingdom of God that cannot be shaken. So at the moment, what is the key word for 2020? What is everyone saying? Man, there's a big shaking. And I wouldn't be surprised if we even have that, not just in terms of, of an unsettling of our social life, political life, uh, economic life, and all of these things, but even physical, that there are going to be great earthquakes, shaking. God is shaking everything so that you come to the point of saying, where am I? Am I with God or am I in a place where I need God? And if God is going to wake up the church, guess what he's going to get us to do? He's going to get us praying on our knees. Why? Because that is the language of breakthrough. That is the language of getting the things from God into our life. That is the language that calls upon the name of the Lord, as it says in Scripture, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be? Right. How do we do this? God, have mercy on me. Bang, and it's done. And it builds up from there again and again. And we need to get to be so familiar with the language of prayer that we are so comfortable in seeing the ministry of angels bring about the answers of God wherever we go, expectantly. And then, I want to give you three positive things. That was the negative side of things. Why do we need it? Positive things. In Revelation 2 and 3, we see something amazing. Jesus walks among the churches, walking among us, and he says, to the church in, say this, to the church in, say that, to the church in Toowoomba, say this, to living grace, say this, we have a church angel. At our last prayer night, Helen, Helen, if you're watching, due to you, and Helen saw over there an angel taking note of the prayers that we are offering. I think she saw our church angel. And one of the things is that not only churches have angels, you have angels, and they are all assigned and they have assignments. So this is wonderful news. We have an angel over this place looking after us. And the fifth point is actually from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and also you can see it again in Ephesians 2, chapter 6. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing. There's not one thing that we are lacking. What is the lacking? Because we have every spiritual blessing from heaven that comes into this world. What is lacking? That is where our work is. That is our role. We bring the blessings of God to bear on to the things that are needed here. That is our priestly role. Come to God. Get those blessings. Pour them in. Then as we've done it, go back and get some more. Pour it in. We need to get busy as priests. Get back to God. Get some more stuff. Bring it out to people where it's needed. Get back to God. Get some more stuff. So as you are blessed in your coming out and your coming in, you will always have plenty for the work that is there set before you. And the last point of those, we have that in Matthew chapter 18, which I thought was so cool. This is for all the little ones. It actually says here to be very careful how we deal with the little ones because they have angels and they have the face of God before them all the time. In other words, what's happening on the small scale has direct access to God's awareness of what's happening people, but as well as all the small stuff that we're involved in. Don't fret the small stuff. We have that from God's Word too. Small beginnings, they're very important. So as I said, 
there's going to be a great move of God and it's going to be out in the pews and it's going to be out in the streets. It's going to be out in the marketplace. Here's something amazing then when we need to take this seriously and I think this is what we need to do. This people movement will go hand in hand with a spiritual movement. I believe that. And that is why Jesus taught us to pray when we speak and address our Abba Father, holy be your name. Then how does it go on? Your kingdom come and your will be done. Can you see it? When we pray, we pray on earth as it is in heaven. We know God's will. God's will is to heal. How do I know that? What did Jesus do when he walked around? I know God's will is for the demons to be thrown out. How do I know that? When Jesus walked around, what did he do? Etc., etc. If you want to know, if you sort of think, oh, but I don't know God's will, check out what Jesus did. That is going to be enough to start with. Then do it. And he said, all authority has been given to me, so now you go. Go into that authority. You've got it. I've got it. I've got your back. I've got your front. I've got your side, your top, your bottom. I've surrounded you with my authority. You go in that authority. I'm with you always, even to the close of the age. Go and experience what I have done. I have already won the victory on the cross. Now you just go and have fun with that. Bring the victory into people's lives. God thinks that victory is so important that he's sharing it. He could have finished it right then. But he said, you know, this was so much fun. It was hard. Yeah, I got nailed for it. But I won. And I have the victory. And now anyone who is in my name, who shares my name, who is in Christ, who professes that faith, I want you to enjoy that victory over all of the evil stuff that happens in your life. You use my name. You use my authority. In Jesus' name, demons get out. In Jesus' name, be healed. In Jesus' name, whatever it is that is needed, you do it. So here's the interesting thing then. When he's saying to us, go in my authority, make disciples, how do we do it? In Scripture, you have three things. Teach them. Well, we've been doing that for 2,000 years. I hope that there's enough being taught. You can go to Kurong or you can go online. and There is so much stuff that I don't think we need to do any more teaching. You need to go and get the download and start doing it. But the second thing that I think that we need to do in terms of making disciples is free them. And that's something that we have not done. That's something we need to learn how to do better. Some places have been doing it. So in this church, it is part and parcel of what we do. Because guess what? We've got a saying up here that reminds us again of how important the freeing part is. It's not just wise words. It's not just the teaching. not just proclaiming, but the demonstration of God's Spirit. And so free them. Free them from all that binds them into this nothing pit and release them And that is the thing is that the other thing, the third point, release them into the ministry of the saints. Like I said, no more pew sitters. No more waiting on the bench and watching everyone else play the game. It's almost like, here's the football, have a go, have a kick. And like I said, with that little smoke, smile on my face, no one puts baby in the corner, come out and dance lie. To me, this really is so important. God is doing something that he is getting excited for you and for me, for everyone here. And so I want to declare something now. I want to finish off with doing a ministry of declaration over you so that it is not just my words that you will start to believe that this is actually from God's word declared over you. Would you allow me to do that? Are you ready to receive that? Here's my first declaration, and all three are from straight out from scriptures. But these are the truths that I now declare, that scripture declares, that Jesus in his authority declares over you. This is your reality. This is what we need to believe. First one is actually from John 4.4. 4. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Say it with me. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Over here. Greater is he who is in you 
than he who is in the world. And greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. God has poured himself in you. Greater above anything else that you're going to face. Greater is he who is now in you. By the Holy Spirit, in what Jesus has done, he is greater in you. That is a present reality, a now reality, than he who is in the world. Who is that? Satan's in the world. Jesus in you. So greater is everything that God has poured out than anything that Satan will ever throw at you. Be confident as greater is he who is in you than the guy that's out there making all the mischief. Second declaration I want you to believe and receive today is from also from 1 John. It's in chapter 3, verse 8 where Jesus declares something very important of what his agenda is. I have come to do away with the works of the devil. Say it with me. I have come to do away with the works of the devil. Do you believe that? Claim it. When Jesus came, he said, that's what I came to do. I've come to nullify the works of the devil, to get that out of your space, to get it out of your face, to get it out of your life, to get it out of anything else that touches you, I have come to do away with the works of the devil. And now the clincher to it all, and this is, this is the hard one for me. Every time that I read it, I still hear, if you like, that menacing voice that says, but that's not going to be you. But I want to believe that it is going to be me. And if I am right, that God is going to restore things to the church, I want to see things that happen to the disciples be part of my normal life. And one of the things that I'm looking for and longing for, sorry, Evan, it might actually be kind of like stepping on your toes, but do you remember when Peter was walking along and his shadow fell over the sick and they got well? Wouldn't that be great? Go into hospitals. What happened? Jesus. <laughs> and so, when I'm thinking, what God has done in the past, He is going to do right now. He's going to do it among us. Here is the third thing that you need to believe. Also from Scripture, Jesus' own words over you and for me, over His disciples. You will do the works of Jesus and even greater things. John 14, verse 12. You will do the works of Jesus and even greater. I want us to pause for a moment. I want us to stay with that in holiness. God has declared this over you. You will do the works of Jesus. He's enlisting you in the same things that Jesus did and you're going to do even greater things. You can put it on a shelf or you can take it to heart and live it, begin to work it out. What I want to share with you is, and this is um, something that just came to me this morning while I was getting ready, but I was just sort of thinking, wow, I'm going to just leave this with you now while we then move into a bit of ministry time. It's from Zechariah chapter 4. And the reason why I want to share it is that here Zechariah has this ministry of angels. Right? Then an angel who walked with me returned and woke me up. The church will be wakened up. People will be waking up like someone awaking from a sleep. And he asked me, What do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Where did we hear before the seven lampstand? Yeah, check that out. The churches. And I asked the angels who walked with me or talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And he answered, do you not not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord. Not by might, 
nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. The gracious heavenly Father, it is by your Holy Spirit whom you have given to us that all of this is possible because through Jesus Christ, as he has come into this world, has won the victory over everything that is not of you. So Lord, we give you permission in our life. Search me, O Lord, and put a new and right spirit within me so that it may be true that it's not by might nor by power, but by the Holy Spirit, Lord, that all of this is possible. And so that we can have the confidence that we can walk into the spiritual realm and not be in fear because we have your holy angels guarding us and all around us and doing the ministries that are assigned to them. So we can come before your heavenly throne in boldness, as Scripture says. And so we come there right now and we ask in boldness for your favour to be upon all the prayers that we have spoken out and all the prayers that have been on our hearts all the prayers, Lord, that have pleaded for an answer. Lord, would you be so gracious now as we know that you have already given us your answer, that the holy angels would now be dispatched to bring that into our experience. Every single one of us, without delay, without the menacing hands and grubby hands on the answer, let it be a clean traffic all the way through from God's holy throne into our receiving. So, Lord, first and foremost, we want to receive your word upon us. And that is where we want to stay and that's where we want to have our strength because it is indeed you are greater in us than anything else that we will face. Lord, make your home with us. This weekend... In the Jewish calendar, the Jews are celebrating Zakot, that is, tabernacle, not realizing that it is through your Holy Spirit, through Jesus, who tabernacled among us, that you are making your home with us. Lord, we again say, be at home with us. Be greater in us than anything else that we have to face. And Lord, we also pray, just as your word has said, that you have come to do away with all the works of the devil. So, Lord, we give you permission to do that right in front of our noses, right in front of our faces. Wherever we go, may there be kind of like a sweeping away of all the works of the devil as you go before us. And then, Lord, we want to worship you and come back in praise because we are doing the works of Jesus and even greater works. Because when you did it, you did it as a single person and show the disciples what you're going to do to the church for the church, with the church, the body that is Christ. And now you're releasing us to be in that work, the work of Jesus. Lord, even greater, because there's going to be a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the masses of people who call upon your name, and it's going to be all over the world. That is the greater thing. It's going to be a huge move of amazing things of God, because we believe your word. Your word is truth. May it so in Jesus' holy name. And join with me now, if wherever you are now, where you are, let's just join in prayer all together. Whether you want to pray a prayer of thanks or pray in tongues or whichever way the Holy Spirit moves you, let's keep this going. Receive it for you for this day. Ita bakua de la Hermo Hona and the Likia de Beto, a la Hama and la Kia de Betinda, the Hermo Hora de la Hadabatita, the Kede Bakoa, la Hermania de la Kita Bakuta, Homoniata. Another, we worship you, we glorify, we honor you, Lord, Heavenly Father. We thank you that you sent Jesus Christ so that he may take the sins of the world upon himself and release us from the grips of sin. We are free, and we are free indeed because of the blood of Christ is upon us. And you have made your home with us. You tabernacled with us. Now make your home with each and every one of us. Go home with us. Be at home wherever we are. And in our ministry, as we walk it out, where our shadow will fall, may there be amazing blessings that flow from us because your presence is shining upon us and working through us every day. We pray that we will start to see not just our lips moving in desperation for a prayer, 
but we will see with our eyes the answers as our lips finish off with an amen that you have already provided the answer. Lord, I know in Scripture the angels are moving as fast as lightning, it says. So, Lord, your answer can be there before we even finish the words. We pray it in Jesus' holy name with thanks on our heart, thanks to the holy angels. Lord, send us more angels so that your word, this word, our word in prayer may be done. We pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And you may like to, yeah, go on. You're always my fan club. Hey, that's the second time. <laughs> may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you now, in you, through you, and shine upon you everywhere you go. May the fellowship of the Holy Spirit surround you with so much joy that every moment will give you a moment of praise be to God. May his presence never leave you, but always uphold you. In Jesus' holy name we pray and declare it. Amen. Go in a blessing. So let's, let us pray for Nikki, because I think that um, you know, we have declared, God has given us a word, we've declared it out in faith, we are still waiting on it, we know God has given the answer, we have that nauseousness that is now, because Nikki is now getting into a very, very precarious time, it's getting very, very dangerous for her, uh, she really needs that heart, let's pray. Okay. I got the job. You got the job. I, yeah, yeah, like, okay, um, I pray for Nikki first, hey, and uh, see how we... Sorry. Got no, the word. I, got the I had the word during the service that Victoria has a very strong anti-Christian stronghold and that this is part of that, it's like in the uh, story of Daniel where they can't, the angels can't get past because of the strongholds. <laughs> Father God, we think of this and you have reminded me of the strongholds. So, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I break the strongholds that are holding back the angels of life for, for Nikki, particularly uh, within the church, within the government, and within Victoria itself, the whole um, state. I break in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, that, that is a big prayer. Can I just, like, um, <laughs> can I encourage you to come along to the Mega Night of Prayer once a month? It's actually not a gimmick. Like, you know, we have a bit of fun snoring around, you know, for three hours or whatever. But um, we, we did realize that we were a little bit light on on prayer. We needed to step up again. And I think, was it at the last Mega Night of Prayer, uh, someone had the vision that we, we drew the swords, like, you know, in, in the spirit, and prayer is, is warfare, the swords, but they were rusty. And, uh, you know, um, that was confirming, I guess, the conviction that I had that we needed to step up in prayer again. And, you know, if you find that your prayer sword is a bit rusty, once a month come because we can do this together and it's easier to do it together. M my, my response to uh, Myrna's prayer is that, yeah, Victoria, you know, there, there's um, spiritual warfare and all sorts of things, Right here, our little church, we do not have the authority to break whatever is of the state of Victoria. 
you know, like, um, you got to know your authority, what you can do and cannot do. So, like, you on your own, you cannot just mess with things unless there's actually the backup power, maybe the unity of churches or something like that. But what we can do is we can pray for Nikki and we can bind and we, we can pray an opening for her. Like, I think that's authority. She's part of the body of Christ here. You know, okay, like, I'm not teaching now. We had enough. Um, but, Lord, there we, we're getting a download this morning, and it's about ministry of angels. And, Lord, we want to um, operate with them. We want to know our role in prayer and how angels respond to it and how you instruct us. To, to deal with fallen angels. And Lord, again, we pray for Nikki in your name and what, whatever is attacking her right now, the, the nausea, whatever is, is causing that, or, or the works of the evil one, we undo now in your name. And we declare that you gave us a promise for healing for her and that word is strong and it's life. And we pray life into her. And no matter what is happening in the state of Victoria, we, we bind whatever is attacking Nikki right now and we rebuke the pain, and we declare that she be well, and that that pain is leaving her right now, and she's getting the new heart that we're waiting for in your name. Amen. Have a wonderful Amen. Sunday. Amen. Prayer will continue. You can catch up with one another as